Thank you. Good night. Well, hello, everyone. My name, of course, is Honey LeBronx, a.k.a. the vegan drag queen. No big deal. Hold for applause. I'm going to start with the jokes and the lighthearted humor up front because has any, was anyone here two years ago when I gave this speech last time? Okay, wonderful. Well, then I can use the same jokes for the most part. Um, this is a speech that, like, I'm going to give a trigger warning that there will be trigger warnings about, like, everything. Just imagine everything that triggers you. We're going to talk about it. Um, so this is your chance to leave. All right, you're all still here. This is that point in the roller coaster where, like, the thing is coming down, and now you can't get off the ride. So uh, if you want to leave, you can. Um, but I want to start by thanking some people. Thank you so much to Doreen, and thank you so much to the largest veg fest in Europe for saying yes to a little homely drag queen. Um, now, j just to get it out of the way, because I'm sure you're all wondering, are there any RuPaul Drag Race fans in the room? Okay, I wasn't on that show, but everyone here is asking me. My drag mother did win season eight. I'm sure we all know Miss Bob the Drag Queen is my drag mom. An ex-vegan. You can tweet at her about that. Um, and my drag sister, Ms. Cracker, was just on season 10. So I'm just saying that to get a little bit of me out of the way. Um, so basically, if make some noise if you already know who I am. Great. New fans. In fact, you know what? Because of that, I got a clipboard for you guys, and I'm the drag queen, so I shouldn't have to move. So this lovely young lady is going to grab a clipboard, and this team over here is going to send up this socialist to grab this clipboard for me. And y'all are just going to circulate those so that if you want to keep in touch with me, drunk dial me, whatever, you can just write as legibly as possible, and then I can keep in touch with you and let you know when I'm going to be back in Berlin or like when I'm just stuck down downtown and need a ride. So um, if you have never heard of me before, allow me to introduce myself. I am Honey LeBronx, the vegan drag queen. I am the host of my own cooking show on YouTube, uh, just vegan drag queen on YouTube. I'm not hard to find. Do people are like, what, vegan dry cleaner? Yeah. Because that, you know, that I had to follow my dream. I'm the vegan dry cleaner. Although that would not be a bad idea now with the wardrobe I have. So you can also, if you like the sound of my voice as much as I love the sound of my own voice, you can take me home with you in podcast form. My podcast is Big Fat Vegan Radio. Again, you don't need to write that down. You're not going to forget it. Um, and just one last thing to get out of the way before we jump into this speech. You all might as well take out your telephones right now. Take them out. Hold them up in the air. Take your telephones out. And you are going to open Instagram. Now, if you're over the age of like 65, that's an app which is short for application. You, you know what? Don't even worry about it. So we're going to open Instagram, and you're going to hit search, and you are going to type in Honey LeBronx. That's H-O-N-E-Y-L-A-B-R-O-N-X. And you are going to follow me on Instagram, and that way we can be friends forever. You should know I'm very vegan, very political, and very angry about a lot of things in the world. So just know that before you check my Instagram. So um, here we go. Shall we jump into the speech? All right. Well, you know, I've learned the hard way not to ask the audience what they want. I did that once. I was hosting the National Animal Rights Day in New York City. All I had to do is say, thank you. You've been lovely. Good night. But I chose to say, who wants another number? One woman in the front row just said, I'm good. <laughs> and you can't just be, well, all right. Well, you know where to find me. You have to be like, all right, you got it. Hit it. Um, and it was terrible. So anyway, so that's, how, that's who I am, and that's a little bit about me. Um, I would like to just acknowledge that um, we are going to talk about a lot of social justice issues. So there's no trigger warnings to give because we're talking about them all. So basically, um, it's really exciting for me to be in Berlin just because I am so thrilled to get out from under the thumb of my current presidential administration. I'm so happy to be here in Berlin, which is like one of the veganist places in the world at the largest veg fest in Europe. 
um, into a place that is so forward thinking and so socially progressive. And yet, at the same time, there's still a lot here to fight for. I mean, let's be real. I mean, there's an actual Nazi party still having some political power and they're running for this nationalist platform. Like, history is just repeating itself all over again and here we are in 2018. Like, we are still fighting this again like a hundred years later. So the world as we inherited it is far from perfect. Y'all are right on time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, when I do that, you're gonna clap for no reason just to buy me time to hydrate. So, um, and I'm not cheating on you. With, I'm not like looking at my homework. I've got a script here because I changed this guy so much that it's, 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 I don't bother memorizing it. So basically, like everywhere else in the world, there's still an ongoing struggle for social justice in many areas. As I like to say it, the world that we inherited is far from perfect. So where do we start to make the world a better place? Y'all can hear me in the back, right? I don't need to worry about doing this. You can hear me just fine, great. So a wise person once said, if the oppressed are busy fighting each other, those in power win. In the 1960s in the United States, the civil rights movement was fighting for the rights of black people in America. They were faced with discrimination in voting, housing, and segregation laws. At the same time, women were fighting against discrimination in jobs, legal representation, and sexism in the media. And yet, the victories won by both black people and women were not benefiting everyone equally within those communities. For example, companies who started hiring black employees, they started hiring black men, but not black women. Whereas other companies that started hiring female employees, they were hiring white women, not black women. So here black women are fighting for women, fighting for black people, and they're like, how are we still left out of that? Um, and this is where the idea of intersectionality began to arise out of the multiracial feminist movement who saw that black women in particular experienced increased discrimination because of both their gender and the color of their skin. This theory was largely pioneered um, by Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor at UCLA, who said that the experience of being a black woman cannot be understood in terms of the sum of its parts. You don't just add woman to black and that equals what it's like to be a black woman. But that these identities have to be considered, you can't consider them independently, but they interact and frequently reinforce each other. Then, in the 1990s, as the theory began to gain prominence through the work of sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, she pointed out how cultural patterns of oppression are not only interrelated, but they're actually bound together and influenced by the intersectional systems of society, such as race, gender, class, and ethnicity. Collins refers to this as interlocking oppression. And today, this concept is expanding to include issues of ability, species, and sexual orientation. And it can be defined as the interconnected nature of social categorizations as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. And through an awareness of intersectionality, we can better acknowledge and ground the differences between us. Now, you're probably at this point wondering, am I at the right festival? This is like the animal rights thing, right? We are talking about black women in the 1960s in America. There is a reason for all of this. We're doing some social justice history, and that's gonna catch us up to where we stand today as an animal rights movement. So to understand oppression, we first need to understand privilege. What is it? How does it work? So now I'm going to go into a little bit more social justice history. So each of us in this room has varying identities. I myself am white. 
I'm gay, I'm vegan, and even though I'm a drag queen, I know, you had no idea. She's like, I thought you were a real woman. Um, although I am a drag queen, I do identify as a cisgender male, which simply means it's the opposite of trans. It just means I'm not trans, but instead, I agree with the gender I was assigned at birth. So some aspects of my identity come with certain privileges, just as others come with certain disadvantages. For example, growing up gay in the Midwest of the United States, I can certainly identify with being a member of an oppressed community. I know what it's like to be afraid of gym class for fear of being bullied in the locker room. I know the sting of not being able to take my boyfriend to the school dance. But don't worry, I had one of my friends, she brought him as her date, and then I brought her girlfriend as my date, and then like we all just connected inside the dance. Um, one of my, uh, to, to grow, I know what it's like to grow up not seeing people like me represented in the media, and to grow up never seeing gay couples or same-sex affection shown on television in a positive way. I got the picture loud and clear that as a kid, whatever I was, I'm not normal. And if I want to have a good life, I have to try as hard as I can to hide who I really am. Even when I had a boyfriend, I was 14, and uh, I remember being afraid to hold his hand or give him a kiss in public, because, duh. And I remember once we were at the mall, and we were very bravely holding hands, and then all of a sudden he let my hand go, and I'm like, why did you let my hand go? He's like, well, there's kids over there. And I thought, is there something about our love that's so gross or so awful that kids should be kept away from it. I mean, this is the identity that I inherited as a homosexual. Um, and despite the fact that I can say I've known oppression, I have to acknowledge that because of my identity, I have many privileges as well. As a white person, I don't live in fear that the police might treat me unfairly because of the color of my skin. When I enter a shop, I am not afraid that the storekeeper is going to follow me or harass me. I'm not worried that my hair, but the color of my skin, or the name that my parents gave me is ever going to prevent me from finding a good job. Now, as a man, I seldom worry about my physical safety when I'm walking home alone at night in New York City, unless, of course, I'm in drag. But let me just say, this is not an easy, if you want to get something out of me, like, you're going to have to really fight for it. So, like, I've not really experienced much discrimination, except, like, a moment ago, right before, outside, I get to see what it's like experiencing street harassment. Like, if you've touched, I know that it's fake but it's mine. These are my work material. Like, you know, you have, you know, maybe like a pair of pliers at work that are yours. These are my titties, don't touch them. And after telling someone the fourth time, no, please don't touch them. And then he asks, can I touch them? I'm like, this is what my nieces are gonna have to go through in 10 years time if nothing changes. And I don't see anything changing fast enough that I can put my money on. My four-year-old will never have to go through that. That is not okay with me. So, as a cisgender male, I don't fear for my safety every time I wanna use a public restroom. I don't worry about being demonized by the media because of my gender or what I have between my legs. People generally see me as a white, as a white cisgender male. They see me as someone who is trustworthy, respectable, and normal, even knowing nothing about me. And I have a past, let me tell you. Uh, so many people who hear about white privilege or male privilege, they often react harshly saying, well, it's not my fault that I have these privileges, or some, or like, I didn't ask for it to be this way. Or some will even flat out deny the existence of privilege because they'll say, well, I grew up poor, I had to fight, I lived, I'm white, but I lived in a mostly black community and I was the outcast. No one is saying that that's not also a thing, that's not possible. Um, you know, there are many poor white people, I'm one of them, hi, 
There's many men performing hard manual labor and earning low wages. Um, and, there, and cisgender women still face, face plenty of, of discrimination and oppression. Um, you know, like earning less money than men or not being taken seriously when they need to report that they've been, you know, assaulted to the police. To be clear, acknowledging your privilege, it's just you saying, yes, I can see that I have certain privileges that I can rely on, but I didn't do anything to earn them. And I can see that someone who is a different gender or skin color or whatever doesn't have those same privileges. Um, this to me all seems very obvious at first, but when you start in on a conversation about privilege, it's kind of comical to me, the kind of arguments you get right back immediately. So we're gonna kind of start by like going through some of those so that everyone here is on the same page. So these are simply privileges I was born with and I did nothing to earn, but they will always work in my favor. And it's just my way of saying, I wish everyone had that. And of course, I enjoy that as a man, people listen to me when I speak. I enjoy that I don't live in fear of police brutality as a white person, and that I can use a public restroom without fear. Honestly, I don't know what it's like being transgender. I do know as a drag queen, I can use whatever drag, I could use the bathroom right here. No one is gonna stop me. A drag queen can get away with pretty much anything. So there are certain privileges that I just love that no one's gonna come up and tell me, ma'am, ma'am, you know, no one's gonna say that. So acknowledging my privileges, it's just me saying everyone should have that. If we truly had a level playing field, everyone would be able to nod and be like, I have that. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's like for me. So the good news about privilege, though, is that we can actually use our privilege for the greater good, to make the world a better place. If you're white, you can use your privilege to speak out for people of color. Because I am generally listened to by other white people, I can make a real difference by calling out other white people when they use language that perpetuates the oppression of people of color. If you're male, you can use your privilege to speak out for women. You can speak out against the ongoing epidemic of street harassment. And next time one of your guy friends disrespects a woman in public, you can tell him, hey, knock it off. Imagine how scary that would be for you if you were in her shoes right now. Um, and if you are human, you can use your voice to speak out for the animals. And honestly, if you're a drag queen, I don't think I see any here. No, I don't think. Uh, you can use the attention that drag gets to speak out for the animals and make a difference. You can literally use whatever talents and advantages that you have to help amplify the voices of marginalized people. So first, when I was preparing to give this speech, I got a book that a friend told me. She's a big global speaker on animal issues, and she's like, you should get this book. It's literally called How to Give a Speech, and thank you, thank you. Applaud for me while I drink so that... Oh, you're too kind. Um, when I was preparing to give this speech, I read a book on how to give a speech and it was so disinteresting to me because it started off by saying, well, you need to get to know your audience. So are they mostly going to be men or women? Um, is there anything culturally or historically relevant about the place where you're giving this speech or the day in history that you're giving this speech? Will your audience be waiting for your speech to end because they're going to dinner after this? Or will they have just had lunch and they need a nap? Like, really, you need to know these things. And I was like, I don't care if I'm talking to men or women, I don't care how old they are, I don't care if they're hungry or waiting for me, I'm just gonna talk to them about social justice and I just want them to listen. I just wanted this book to tell me, here is the right thing to say and here is the right way to say it, go get them, by the way, you look amazing. And a while ago, I was talking with a new friend who isn't vegan he didn't really seem interested in becoming vegan, but he asked me why I'm vegan. Well, 
I went on for about 20 minutes and it was the best summary I've ever given of why I'm vegan, why it helps the environment, why it's better for the economy, why it's better for my health, and so on. I made such a compelling argument for veganism that I thought, there's no way he's getting out of here without being vegan. And at the end of my speech, he said, yeah, well, that's good for you. And I was so upset because I'm like, I said all the right things. I said the right words. How can he not care? And then it hit me. You know, I was reading this book that was telling me I should know something about the people I'm talking to. And I realized I have no idea what this guy is dealing with, where he's coming from. And the more we talked, I found out that he's ex-military. His family kicked him out when they found out he's gay. And they told him that they hope he dies of AIDS. This is someone who's really dealing with things in his day-to-day -day life. Nowhere in my little impromptu speech did I include anything about what he's dealing with or did I show him that I even care about him. I just had an agenda. I was the smart one. He's there to listen and that was that. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot of reasons to go vegan, right? I mean, a lot of people are vegan for the environment, for their own health, but I think we can all agree, is there one most important reason to go vegan? I, I have one that I think is most important. Perhaps you do say it with me. The most important reason to go vegan is to piss people off. No, sometimes that's enough. On days where I'm just like, oh, it's just all too much for me. I'm like, if I show up and I ask if they have any non-dairy milk, someone's gonna have a bad day. And that, that is enough for me on some days. Anyway, the point of talking to this guy was that everyone out there knows something you don't. Everyone out there is dealing with something you, ha you know nothing about. So get curious. Give yourself permission to actually walk around this world with a sense of wonder, like, who is this person with the updo, looking perfect? Like, what did she have to go through to get here? Like, what has her journey been like being vegan? Has it all been easy? Probably not. If I gave her 20 minutes and I said, tell me five things about your life that would fascinate me, I would walk away thinking, this is the most amazing person in the world. And everyone's got that, but we walk around so, not even disconnected, just so disinterested, we're more interested in what it is we have to say to them. So the only way I feel to make a difference for someone is to first of all find out what they care about, what they're dealing with, and what really matters to them. If I wanna to talk to people about why they should go vegan, I also need to understand that they're dealing with things that I don't have to deal with. Now to be clear, animal liberation is the number one issue that is closest to my heart, but you know what? It is not the only thing I care about. It's not the only social or political or artistic endeavor that matters to me. It's probably the most important to me because I am literally fighting, we are literally fighting for the lives of 150 billion land animals alone who are killed every year according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. But animal rights isn't the only cause that needs our attention. And it certainly is not all that I'm capable of caring about. Now, if we aren't checking in with other social justice movements, and with other individuals who experience oppression, then we really do give the appearance of being selfish and one-sided. We care about our cause, but we refuse to care about any cause other than our own. So I think I've already said enough earlier about what other individuals are dealing with, but a few things I would like to bring up. Today, there is literally nowhere in the world that women are considered equal to men. I just gave this speech in Reykjavik, Iceland, and the person who brought me in to give the speech said, Iceland is the number one most gender equal place in the world. And some guy said to her, like, well, you should be very proud of that. She's like, why would I be proud of that? 
we're not equal here. This is as good as it gets anywhere in the world. I am 39 years old and I grew up knowing that men and women aren't equal. I never would have believed you if you told me 39 years later, you, you will, we will still be fighting for the same things. It's b mind boggling. And now that I'm an uncle and I have five nieces, the thought that they're gonna grow up having to say something like I said no five times in order to be heard once like I would have to say or like their brothers and cousins would have to say if they're male, so not okay with me. Um, refugees all around the world, Syrian refugees have been, become the, the, the subject of so much contentious debate when literally all they are trying to do is what anyone in this room would do for their families or their own safety if they were in the same situation. And, and I'm surprised to find out that so many people don't know about this. I don't know how it is in this country, but in the United States, people are completely unaware that for two, maybe even three years now, maybe two, there's still an ongoing gay holocaust happening in Chechnya. Gay and bisexual men are being rounded up, tortured, detained, even killed by the government. Recently, a 20-year-old man who managed to escape to St. Petersburg, Florida, he was out one day taking the trash out in the backyard of the safe house when a van pulls up, Two masked men jump out of the car and kidnap him, and they were going to take him to kill him. One of those men was his father. Because in Chechnya, you are told, if you have a gay family member, you either kill them or the government will. But if the government has to do it for you, you are just as guilty of their crime as they are. So here, the families are like, the only way to get the government to not hate us and make our lives hell is i got to go find my son and kill him. This is just to give you an idea of some of the things that people in the world might be dealing with. And if I've mentioned anything that you don't have to deal with, I hope you see how lucky you are that there are some realities that you just never will have to face. So, imagine if I turned the right page, or just memorize this. Um, and literally, recently in the United States, we just refused visas to 40 men who were trying to escape from Chechnya. We sent them away. And I could go on about the plights of other people in different communities, but perhaps now you identified a few things that you're like, I'm lucky I don't have to deal with that. So there are animal rights activists. I know we've heard them. And I don't think it's most of us, but there are animal rights activists out there who say, oh, I only care about animals. As if that is something to be proud of. The, the, this diminishes our ability to make a difference in the world. Here we are actually believing that we only have enough compassion and enough power to make a difference in one area. For, for people as evolved and aware and passionate as vegans, to think that we can only make a difference for the animals, it's incredibly short-sighted. In fact, I think it would be hard to find a community who feels as deeply and who thinks as rationally as animal rights activists and who fights as tirelessly as we do. So can you imagine how big a difference we could make in the world if this whole room decided, I'm fighting for women, that is my fight. Whether or not I'm a woman, I am fighting for women. I am fighting for people of color. I am fighting for Muslims. I am fighting for transgender people and for their inclusion. Could you imagine how quickly we could transform the world if we all recognize that is also our fight. As much as the animals are my fight, so is all of that, because none of it is right. And here's the thing. We have to remember that not only is our own community comprised of people from all faiths, they're men and women and trans people, but our target audience will most likely fall into one of those demographics. And no matter how brilliantly you speak, no matter how great your talking points are, or how convincing your argument, these people will be thinking in the back of their minds, well, what about me? 
What about my struggle? Are you my ally? Or are you just preaching to get one more person on your team? If we're going to make allies, which is to make new vegans out in the world, which let's face it, that's the only option we have left, right? We have to go out and make more vegans. People always talk about like the homosexual agenda. They have to recruit because they can't reproduce. I'm like, ma'am, you're, you're thinking about vegans. It, that's the vegan agenda. I very much have an agenda. Yes, I am trying to recruit. I have to make new vegans because we can't recreate them. Yes, you're right. As far as the gay agenda, I, if only it were that easy. So the only option that we have, because the, the only thing I don't like about being vegan, I'll be honest, I can only do it once. I can't like go vegan again. I can't go vegan for you or you or you or anyone else. In the, I can only go vegan once it's done. Now I got to work my magic on everyone else. Um, but in order to make new vegans out there, we have to find out what other people care about, what they're dealing with, and what's important to them, and how can we make a difference for them? Because when they ask you, well, what about police brutality? Or what about Trump threatening to ban all Muslims from the United States? And you can't genuinely show that you share their concerns and you know enough about the issue, then what gets revealed in that moment are all the things you don't have to worry about in addition to fighting for animals. These people don't have the luxury of getting to say, I only care about animals. Now here's the good news. I know I'm going to live long enough to see animal liberation in my lifetime. But we're only going to get there as one. This whole idea that, well, first we're going to fight for people of color, then the gays, then women, if we have time, then transgender rights. This kind of hierarchy of social persecution will always put animals last. We are outranked in that opinion. And until people can connect the dots and start to see all oppression and all suffering as equal, animal suffering will always be their last priority in the fight for social justice. We also cannot defeat speciesism while contributing to other systems of oppression. By seeing all oppression as connected, we avoid ranking some forms as more important than others. It's fine to have one main focus as your main cause, and it's great if you can even support other social justice movements and build bridges with them and use your privilege to help amplify marginalized voices. But I also want to be very clear, you don't have to do any of that. In fact, sometimes when you don't know how to help, the best thing you can do is, honey, don't try. Don't try, don't jump in there. Like, maybe I'll say something. Just doing nothing can be enough. But my point here is that we have to educate ourselves enough that we can stop contributing to someone else's oppression. This is the main goal of a pro-intersectional movement. Anything you can do above and beyond that is just icing on the vegan cake. Of all the theories, by the way, about pro-intersectional uh, social justice, like 90, this is not a real fact, this is an alternative fact, but like about 99% of them do not include the animal, animal rights in their vision. As an animal rights movement, we cannot succeed without involving communities outside of our own. So, when I first heard the idea of intersectionality, I thought, perfect, I can use this as an argument when I'm talking to people who are gay or talking to women or people of color, I can use this as my gotcha opportunity and tell them, well, you're basically a hypocrite unless you're vegan because blah, blah, blah. Now, I can laugh at how naive that was and how short-sighted I was, however noble my intentions were. Um, but I can see now how my privilege made it possible for me to ignore their identities and to tell them what they should be fighting for. Here's what I know now. As a cisgender male, I recognize that I just don't get to tell black people what to do. I just don't. 
I don't get to tell women how they should feel about not having equal rights. I don't get to pretend that I understand everyone in the LGBTQIA plus community. I don't. And I definitely don't get to tell people who are fighting things that I'll never have to fight what they should care about. Here's where I want to say something that's not, on, not in my notes here, but let's be honest for a second. If you really believe everyone should be vegan, raise your hand. Okay, so everyone should be vegan, no matter what. Okay, great. That's a lot of us, right? I certainly have felt that way. It, how, how could I argue that not everyone should be vegan? I'm going to make two exceptions to that. I'm a person in recovery, 10 years sober from drugs and alcohol. Do not thank me. Do not applaud. That, you are welcome. I am, I am not a threat to y'all anymore. But, um, but I do need a sip of water so you can go ahead and clap. Oh, my God. You guys stop that right now. Here's the thing. If you know anyone who's in recovery, there is a correlation between alcohol consumption and blood sugar. So a recovering alcoholic who is giving up alcohol, their body is trying to regulate their blood sugar. And alcohol is a very easy way to get blood sugar. So like several times a day, their body is like, do the thing that spikes our blood sugar, whatever that is. And so they will have intense cravings for alcohol. And this is why alcoholics are told, in your first year of recovery, no major changes. Now, I went vegan. I started reading about veganism and vegetarianism before my first year, but I decided not to make that change until I had a year sober. And here's the thing. I had a friend who was so inspired. She's like, oh my God, you're vegan. I want to go vegan too. I'm like, okay, you have four months sober. This is not your first time trying to get sober. You don't get to go vegan, said the vegan drag queen to someone who wanted to go vegan. I'm like, listen, if you ever get to one year sober, if you make it and you don't die, then you can go vegan. And listen, and she's like, well, why? Why should it matter? I'm like, here's why it matters. At three in the morning, where do you live? She's like, I live uh, Washington Heights, the top of Manhattan. There's nothing up there. It's not a vegan oasis. I'll say it that way. I'm like, great. So in your neighborhood at three in the morning, if you get an intense craving for alcohol, do you know where to go in your neighborhood to buy a pint of vegan ice cream? And she's like, wow, no. I'm like, this is why you don't get to go vegan yet. Now, here's the thing. I had a friend who had 10 months sober and he's like, I'm going vegan. I'm like, don't, you don't stop that. Listen, I'm not saying eat animals. You can just order vegan food as often. If you want to order a vegan meal for all three meals every day, be my guest. Do not decide I went vegan or I'm going to go vegan. Don't decide you've committed to something in your mind because you don't know what's coming. As someone who just celebrated 10 years sober, they always say when you come up on a major anniversary, you start to get a little crazy. I literally started having panic attacks like two weeks before my 10 year anniversary and I had to go and see, I mean like it is not something you want to mess with. So that is one example. Can we all like see like, okay, I get that. I can see that, that, that possible vegan is worth more to the animals alive and fighting for animals than dead in a ditch somewhere. I also have a friend and I'll make this short. I have a friend, Jason and Jason, the Jasons. I've known big Jason for 20 years. He married little Jason 15 years ago. Big Jason dealt with anxiety. I never knew. He took his life in November. I didn't realize that things were that bad for him. It was so debilitating, his depression, that like literally he could not get off the couch. When he went to a grocery store and had to choose a box of cereal, he would just like go comatose and couldn't move or talk. And he needed to be hospitalized. His life was so miserable at the end. He saw no way out but to take his life. Here I am in Ithaca, New York, visiting little Jason. I'm in their home for the first time in the 15 years they've had it, feeling like I'm a real jerk as a friend that I never saw it while he was alive. And Jason, who finally learned to cook, you know, so he could take care of his husband, his order arrives. We have a blue apron, we call it. You get ingredients shipped to you and menu and menus and blah, blah, blah. And he's unpacking. He's like, oh, yeah. So he's unpacking his chicken and his shrimp. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, 
do not apologize to me. Listen, if all that you can manage to do with the rest of your life is pick up the pieces and keep, and keep moving on, and you manage to find some small degree of joy, that is enough. If you never go vegan, listen, I'll just go and make everyone else vegan around you. By the way, this guy is totally going to go vegan because who apologizes for having animal products in their home that's not thinking about it on some level? But now perhaps you can see what I mean when I no longer take the view that everyone should fill in the blank, do anything, right? I mean, everyone should follow me on Instagram and sign up for my mailing list, which is working its way through the audience. But aside from that, I don't know your struggle. So, um, I have to always remember, by the way, that when I'm giving this speech, literally I am taking something from black women, the idea of intersectionality, and I'm using it in a way that they never intended. So I can never assume that my point of view is going to work for everyone. All I can do is continue to make the animal rights community as safe and inclusive and as welcoming as possible for others while continuing to convey the urgency of joining us. For example, saying that racist or sexist or anti-Semitic language will not be tolerated at a protest is one way of creating ground rules to ensure that. There is a religious ritual chicken slaughter that happens in Brooklyn once a year. And it's one of the biggest, most difficult protests of the year. And a few years ago, there was a man who was fighting against us and he pushed a woman. And she got so offended, she called him an anti-Semitic slur and was not even like open to hearing about it when I told her, I'm like, no, that is not cool. You take a time out. You are not helpful to the animals when you are doing that. She kept justifying because she was all up in her feelings. Well, he pushed me. I'm like, it is never okay. To, there's no situation you can think up where it's ever okay to say that or do that. So laying ground rules where we say that just will not be tolerated. One thing I love about this festival is on the website, it is very clear, like, this will not be tolerated. That will not be tolerated. Don't try it. So there are methods of activism that do use tactics or imagery that objectify women or use nudity to get attention, and still others that resort to fat shaming to try to sell people on the health benefits of a vegan diet. And meanwhile, there's people, both vegans and non-vegans, who feel objectified or belittled by these tactics. In America, the feminism movement focuses mostly on white women in the mainstream. And so there's a lot of debate in the, in the feminism movement about feminism versus white feminism. All of this keeps people fighting each other instead of uniting to fight together for our common goal. Intersectionality gives us a set of tools that we can use to craft our message in a way that maximizes our effectiveness without alienating others or supporting the systems or language that oppresses them. When you say that you only care about animals, what you're really saying is, well, I care about rape and murder and torture unless the victim is my sister or unless she's human as if these two things aren't both possible at the same time. Here's the thing. You can't have compassion for this guy over here and then not have compassion for this guy over here because that's not compassion. That is favoritism. Now, if I really want to put this to the test, I have to ask myself, if I have compassion for the animals, how can I have compassion for Donald Trump and the people who voted for him, like my parents. I don't like thinking about that. That kind of makes me want to take that part out of my speech. But the truth is, how am I losing or giving up anything by asking myself, how can I be compassionate towards this person? A friend of mine once said on Facebook that she thinks it's great that I'm vegan, but she'd rather spend her time and energy making the world a better place for people. Like, as if those two things are mutually exclusive. So what is it that makes it easier for us to be kind to animals than to care about our fellow humans? 
Even non-vegans can become outraged when they see images of animal cruelty. It's as if we don't feel we can hold that much compassion in our hearts. Now, it's not uncommon for our first reaction when confronted by a form of suffering or oppression that we aren't familiar with. It's not uncommon for our first gut reaction to be like, oh no, that's too much for me to handle. I can't, I can't understand all of that issue. I can't care about everything I care about and take that on. Someone else is going to have to make that their cause, right? And what we do in those moments is we take our heart away from the issue. We love less and we pull our hearts from that. I like to say compassion is like a muscle. The more that we use it, the bigger it gets, the more that we examine our compassion and exercise our compassion. The more we flex the muscle of compassion and ask ourselves, how can I have compassion for Trump voters? The stronger and bigger our hearts get. And I know I'm saying hearts and that sounds kind of cliche, but if anyone ever here has ever been like heartbroken, let's say by a young kid from Amsterdam who left the country and unfriended you, um, it actually hurts like in your heart. So there is some correlation to like exercising this thing here. But when we find ourselves thinking, oh, I can't handle that, I can't care about that cause, what we can do is catch that thought. Here's the thing, that first thought that pops into your head, you're not responsible for. Here, some of you are thinking, I'm a bad person. If you knew the thoughts that go through my head, I don't care about the thoughts that come into your head. Not the first one. That is the thought that was put there by the automatic conditioning that was programmed into your mind when you were born into this world. That first thought is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is the second thought that comes after that. When I hear myself saying, oh, there's a new thing I'm supposed to care about, I can't. Darfur or what's going on right now in Malaysia, I can't, I can't, it's too much. I can catch that thought and I can remind myself, oh, I'm doing it again. I need to actually bring my heart forward. So you're not, when we hear this thought, and we think our heart isn't big enough, what we can take on is, I'm gonna try loving harder than I ever have tried before. By a show of hands, by the way, raise your hand if, if you have ever just wished that non-vegans would just be open to criticism. Any, well, I can't be alone in that. Keep your hands up if you've ever thought, God, I wish that meat eaters could just listen with an open mind and just consider what I'm saying. Just consider it from the animal's point of view. Just consider it. I'm not saying you have to sacrifice anything or go vegan today or make any changes. But God, just let me contribute to you a point of view that you don't already have so you can see what that might make available to you when you just try that question on for yourself. So again, show of hands, who's felt that way at least once in their life? Okay, most of us, right? Now, raise your hand if you're not vegan. Any non-vegans here? Hey, no one's perfect. No one's perfect. Hey, I've done some awful things too. And I want you to know, vegans, I speak for all the vegans in the room, and I say, vegans don't judge. No, no, guys, none of us are judging you. We're just loving you really, really aggressively. I love you so much. Um, but seriously, now raise your hand if you're vegan. Okay, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if someone's ever accused you of caring more about animals than you care about people. My hand's staying up. I know I've heard it. Okay. Well, now seriously, here's the thing. Don't you think they wish that we would at least consider that question? Don't they wish that we could at least try on their suggestion? Maybe let in their criticism? I mean, if I believe in what I believe in, anyone should be able to say anything at any time to my face about my beliefs or my values, and I should be able to be with their communication. But here's the thing. I, I don't have to make that person wrong or tell them that the way they see it is not the way it is. But if I want people to consider my point of view, maybe we can be the example of how to do that. 
So if we think, be the change you want to see in the world, well, then the next time someone says, you care more about animals than you care about people, we can consider, one, is that true? Two, why is that person saying this? And three, what might I be doing or what might the animal rights community be doing that might give that impression? So to simply tell them they're wrong and to invalidate their point of view is not going to move us or them. And spoiler alert, that's a tongue twister, spoiler alert, there is no such thing as an invalid point of view. It's a point of view. There is literally, there's no possible invalid point of view. It's a point of view. So if we try to invalidate their point of view, they're just going to walk away from that encounter even more certain that they're right and we're wrong. And when anyone mentions veganism, I'm like, oh, I met a vegan once. It didn't go well. So, but at the end of the day, we both want the same thing. We both want peace on the planet in our lifetime. And we want a world that works for everyone. So in what ways might we be giving the impression that we care more about animals and we care more about humans. Well, when I scroll through my friend's Facebook activity, I often see no comment on black people being killed by police in America. I just see post after post after post about animal issues. And yes, I can imagine how that might look to someone who is just looking for a reason to say why you can't care about animals and people. What I can do instead as a pro-intersectional animal rights activist is to realize when it's time to speak out for the animals and when other concerns deserve my attention. For example, I post a lot of stuff on Facebook about animals, but the day after the Las Vegas shooting, probably not the best day to post like undercover footage of a slaughterhouse. The day after two white police officers each with a history of using excessive force, both went free after fatally shooting Alton B. Sterling, an innocent man who committed no crime, that might not be the best day to post a long rant about why people need to stop eating animals. I used to think, by the way, that I can't be sexist, like magic. I, I, I'm gay. I can't be sexist. But then one day I asked myself, what if I'm sexist and I don't know it? And in the days and the weeks that followed, I discovered many opportunities to uncover and address my own sexist thoughts and behaviors. And that made it possible for me to become a feminist ally. Literally, the, after I asked that question, I saw a woman being interrupted by men, and I noticed that the men weren't doing that to each other, only her. And after she was interrupted twice, she never tried again to speak up. And I'm like, I went home to my mom and sister, I'm like, guess what I saw? And I was describing it, and they're like, uh-huh. Sounds like a Tuesday. And then in that conversation, they're like, fun fact, you're doing the same thing right now to us in this conversation. So pro-intersectionality gives us a framework inside of which we can all live in the solution to oppression and social injustice. This movement consists of leaders, people who are primed and ready to consider what it's like for someone else who experiences oppression in a way similar or different to how others experience it for themselves. And these are exactly the people who we need to reach out to and invite them to consider what it's like for the animals. Not just as another thing they have to, to sign up for, but to really get that, oh my God, I can grant somebody their freedom from suffering and torture and murder simply by ordering my food a little differently. How wonderful that they need not do anything else but order their food or their entertainment or their clothing differently. Currently, much of the pro-intersectionality movement ignores the idea that there are animals suffering who need their suffering acknowledged. But because the intersectionality movement is already in this inquiry, because they're already asking themselves these inconvenient and difficult questions and challenging their own views regularly. Pro-intersectionality is not only an idea for vegans to take on for the purpose of being more effective, but the intersectionality movement itself, as I see it, is our greatest ally to date. 
we're not only asking them to consider what it's like for the animals, but to also consider the intersections within the animal agriculture system and how it equally oppresses animals, females, undocumented immigrants, people of color, human rights. If we want to build the animal rights movement, we would do best to build bridges with people who are already fighting for other social justice issues. Now in closing, I wanna say, it's okay to make mistakes. You are all gonna leave here and make mistakes. It's, good, it's going to happen. Even after giving this speech, I am going to make mistakes. I might look back at this speech in a year or month and be like, yeah, I can't believe I said that, or I can't believe I left that thing out. And someone might come up to me and say that I said something I shouldn't have or used language that was sexist or racist, etc. And when that happens, what I get to do is thank them for contributing something to me. And I get to ask them what I can do to be a better ally for other marginalized communities. And that's how I get to continue to grow in wisdom and compassion. Because this is not about perfection, this is about progress. And so long as we can strive to be a little better every day, I know that in our lifetimes, we will dismantle racism, classism, sexism, ableism, speciesism, homophobia, transphobia, and we will have a world that works for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hanina Bronx, for those wonderful words, for those encouraging words, and uh, absolutely great and emotional speech. <laughs> Thank you. What else am I going to do with my time, right? I want to quickly say, now I want to acknowledge that I did go a little over my time, but we still do have time yes. for a Q&A, which is my favorite part because it's where we all get a conversation we likely aren't already having every day. Um, so I would like to open it up to some questions from the audience, but first I want to say by a show of hands, who did not already know about the after party where Honey LeBronx is doing her vegan drag queen show as a fundraiser for the festival and for Travesti für Deutschland? <laughs> Ten, all right, great. Well, y'all should know right after this at 9.15 at, 9 at Bycroft, look on the posters in the back of the room. Now that you follow me on Instagram, look up my latest Instagram post. It's on there. Oh, my second latest. Look for the poster. Or right outside the tent, you'll see the information. So there's an after party. Please come along. We are raising money for the animals. If you have no money, I just want your two feet and your head in the room and the rest of your body too. So do we have questions from the audience? This is my Oprah moment. And it's like the first hors d'oeuvre at the cocktail party. No one wants to be the first one. If you eat that cocktail weenie, someone else will start eating too. Yes. Thank you for your bravery. Um, I often find that people in my social circle are incredibly open-minded towards so many marginalized groups. Um, except for veganism. And that when I start talking about veganism, they just like shut down and put me in this box of like, that's not on the same level. Yeah. Um, how do you handle that kind of reaction? It sounds like you need new friends. I'm, I'm not <laughs> straight, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You know, there is a very human phenomenon. I, I once heard, and this cleared up so many things for me, that our entire experience of being alive, our entire experience of ourselves and our lives, only exists inside of language. Helen Keller talks about before she had language and learned to like speak and talk and read, she had no distinction between like mother, father, teacher, home, outside. The world was just a swirl of like senses that meant nothing. 
the day that she had language, she could start saying, oh, I know what this is. I know what this is. I know what this is. This is the job our brain is always doing for us, whether we realize it or not. And you have to understand, just like I said, if I make the mistake of laughing at that person who says, you know, you just care about animals more than you care about people, or where do you get your protein? If I just laugh and tell them, do you know what a stupid question that is? They're going to walk away like, oh, veganism? Oh, yeah, I met a vegan once. They're really rude and whatever. Your friends think they know what veganism is. They have a preconceived idea of what it is, and it just does not include what you know. This might seem naive, but I don't think anyone could know what those of us in this room know and not be vegan or at least be doing everything we can to work towards it. I always like to say, and I hate this, everyone is on their damn journey. Everyone, Look, my journey turned into this. I went vegan and I became a damn drag queen with a cooking show. This does not have to be what happens to your friends, okay? I mean, honestly, don't come for my gigs. It's better if it doesn't work out that way for them. But everyone's on their journey, and I always find that no one argues veganism with a vegan unless on some level they're looking for information. I have a friend, Vito, he never talks to me about veganism, never asks me, never argues it with me. He has zero interest in going veganism. But all the friends that want to get into a fight with me about it, or they want to argue certain points, I believe that there's a reason that they're asking, and that's part of their journey. And I would love if you could have them be vegan tomorrow. That just might not be what their journey looks like. But you can continue to find out what they're dealing with and what really matters to them and help them see the parallels. You know, it's like, oh, wow, thank you so much for sharing that about your concerns for your daughter. Because you know what? Right now, I'm volunteering at this, you know, animal shelter. And I just found out that they take these babies away from their mom on day one. That's another way in. You know, the only way in is through what they already care about. Any other questions? I feel like there's one or two other questions. I just know that y'all need a minute. You're like, should I? Should I? Yes, in the back. Please don't. Please do not. Listen, I am. Um, actually, if, are there any drag queens in the audience? Anyone here, drag queens? By the way, you do not have to be born a male to be a drag queen. There are drag kings, drag queens. There are male drag queens, female drag queens. Gender does not matter in drag. Um, but there actually are like 48 other vegan drag queens. I've just made it my mission to be like, if there is a vegan drag queen in the world, I'm going to find them. So there is a group I started on Facebook. You can just message me through Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and I'll, if, if you know any vegan drag queens, by all means, put them in touch with me. Um, cause there's 48 of us and now we're starting to do shows together. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. Um, I tour with my... Uh, vegan drag show as a fundraiser for local animal rescues and other organizations as well. I wanted it to be all just the animals, but I find if I'm going to Ypsilanti, Michigan, and I'm trying to raise money for two vegan organizations, they're both asking the same people. If I do one vegan group and one LGBTQ group, then we're going to raise twice as much money for charity rather than splitting it among those same people. But with that said, I've been touring, raising money for mostly for the animals so far. Tonight will be my 44th show this year. Three of them were last year, were, but my 44th show. And I have so far raised $21,433 for the animals. That's like... <laughs> That's like a few hundred um, euro. That's like hundreds of euro. Um, and, uh, but it's my life's work. You know, I'm also a professional theatrical photographer and there's a lot of other day jobs and stuff I had. But I decided, I'm like, I'm done with the survival jobs. Like, a friend of mine told me, no more day jobs, only yay jobs. So only if the job makes me go, yay. So I decided at the beginning of this year, new year, new me. You know, if Mariah can't start the year off on a good note, I will. And so that's literally all I'm doing anymore. So, and I only perform with a guest on stage with me if there's a vegan drag queen in that city. And I'm very happy to say my limit was I had five vegan drag queen guest performers in LA. There was six of us. The, the second and third place most vegan drag queens in any one show, it's a two-way tie for Reykjavik, Iceland, 
and Reykjavik, Iceland. At both of my shows there, I had three. Who knew that in Reykjavik, there's like at least four or five vegan drag queens. It was awesome. And you have one here in town. Uh, my friend Christian, uh, I, I don't, his Facebook name, his drag name is Jupiter. I don't know if he's here. Jupiter, are you here? All right, well, we'll forget it. Uh, but do come to my show tonight and you will see that I don't need guest performers in my show. I got this. I got this. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. I have a question. Jeff, did you get me that protein bar? You did? I'll take it now. I will take it now. Just toss it. I got it. I'm kidding. Jeff Manis, everyone. He, this is the guy who came to New York. We met. Thank you. I said no. I'm just kidding. Um, it's so much fun to mess with him. Um, uh, who, it was his idea. He's like, why don't you come to Berlin and do a speech at the, and I'm like, I've never given a speech. I don't even know what I would say. And then it's like, you went 20 minutes over your time. So, um, any other questions? Thank you. All right, well, if there are no other questions, I'll just say once more, you can find me on Instagram. Um, in fact, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to look and see who followed me on Instagram, and anyone who followed me on Instagram, you're gonna get a free little something from me. Um, so here we go, and if you have not yet followed me on Instagram, you're like, free stuff? I love free stuff. Here's your chance to take out your telephone. I'm gonna turn off airplane mode, and... Um, here we go, opening Instagram, and let me see who followed me. Honey LeBronx, the name is on the board. By the way, if you're sharing about me or whatever, my hashtag is vegan drag queen. No need to write that down. And let's see who followed me. Um, so the first two people that followed me were, well, someone liked so many of my pictures that I can't see who followed me anymore. But I'll tell you the first name, which is not a pro it's a great problem to have, but I do have a, uh, Alex Lavanda, Alex Lavanda here. No, all right. I have uh, a Amy MC zero three three. Okay, no. You have to hoot or holler if I call your name. I'm not going to see you through these lashes. Clean eating Claire. Clean eating Claire, not here. Okay, well you know what? Um, and Felina Knox which sounds like a great drag name or a facial cleanser. Well, then never mind. So it sounds like no one followed me, but if you would like to, um, Honey LeBronx on the Instagram. I'm really effing funny on Instagram. I post some good stuff, so it's in your best interest to follow me. And did that buy anyone enough time to think of one last question? No, all right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love you guys. I love Berlin. I'm so happy to be here again. I hope I'm going to show of hands who's coming to the after party. All right. You can say you saw Bob the Drag Queen's drag daughter on stage, step touching. Um, so I'll see you at the after party. For those of you who aren't coming to the after party, come to the after party. And um, I'll see you guys there. Thank you so much. Thank you.